Good morning, everyone. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce our next speaker, Jim Duratz. Jim grew up in the little coal mining town of Grindstone in southwest Pennsylvania. He would tell you that life was tough, but it was there that he learned to survive, something that would serve him well later in life when he fought through the difficult terrain and conditions in the South Pacific. Jim's childhood dream was to become a state policeman, but there would be a war before he could enter and graduate from the Pennsylvania State Police Academy in Hershey. He later would attend the gra and graduate from Allegheny College. Jim subsequently enjoyed a long career helping develop and expand Armstrong Cable. For many years, he never spoke of his World War II experiences, but now feels it is vitally important that this generation of young people and those to come know and understand why we went to war in 1941 and what he and so many like him endured in standing up to protect and defend the principles we hold so dear in America. What better way to convey that message than to share personal accounts from the men and women who were there? Will you please welcome Jim Duratz. That's pretty much all I was going to talk about. <laughs> but anyway, they talked me into doing this, and I'm, I'm very glad to do it. I was hoping to see some youngsters here, but all you old fellows already know about all this. <laughs> well, there's a couple pretty young. Buddy Bucky. And what, what I thought I'd do is, is I, I served for four years. World War II, half in the South Pacific and the other half in Germany. So I was one of the fortunate ones who was able to be able to talk about both sides and compare them. And that's what I thought it would be nice to do now. It, uh, well, first of all, 16 weeks of basic training in Fort McCollum, Alabama, infantry training, of course. And after that, and, and we pretty much knew that we were that our unit that was training at the time, we were going to go to the South Pacific. And I was glad, because I, that's, I, that's where I really wanted to go. It's, it started back with Pearl Harbor, and I hadn't liked chaps since then. So and I probably still don't. But I don't live like I did before. Anyway, we, go, we were assigned to a ship in San Francisco. It was an APA ship which was designed for, for landing craft. We had a couple of tanks on there. We had big barges. To, we had 3,000 troops on the ship. And we were assigned, we would be assigned to some division when we got over there. So that first we got on the ship and then we started out, and I never got to see the Golden Gate Bridge as we left because I got seasick. <laughs> and I was sick for two days on the ship, and after that, by then we were way out in the ocean. We were almost in Hawaii then. And, and uh, they never had it after that. In fact, you'll see later when I crossed the Atlantic was not a problem. But I got to see it when I come back. But we were on the ship for 48 days to, to get to Guadalcanal. Down here, someplace. Yeah, right here. And then that's when we started practicing landing craft, landing beachheads. Took one of, uh, by then Guadalcanal was ours back. We got it, we had had it back. But we practiced there because it was a natural place to practice. Then from there we went to uh, Hollandia, late, and then ended up went to New Georgia and up to Lady. The Lady practice, I guess we made about 
eight or ten practice landings at night, during the day. When we got the lady, lady had, MacArthur had just waited ashore a couple of days before that. And so they said, now you're going to get some real practice. We're going to mop up. <laughs> so none of us had any kind of a background except our training. And then when they throw you in like that, you just, you have to survive. So you just start shooting. <laughs> so we were there for, oh, a couple, about three weeks doing that. And we ran into quite a few. But not, nothing, they were just hanging around, sort of, and we had to find them. What, what year was that, John? Remember? 44. 44. Yeah, 44. That's another thing. Don't wait for me to finish to ask a question. Just pop right in and ask <laughs> at the time, because then I'll stay in, in order. But uh, not, it was nothing too much exciting in the lady yet, because it's it already it's been taken. But we doing the mop up. We learned how to. We learned how to participate in the jungle. That the jungles was a big part of our training. And, and so we were, we were prepared. Then they had to, Luzon was the last big island in the Philippines. And that's, Manila was the capital of the Philippines. And that's where MacArthur, after, after he was, he stayed in Lady until we got into, we, we got into line in, in Luzon and, and I was, assigned to the 37th Infantry Division. And the, the 37th Division was the first division to leave the states to go into a combat area. They started at Guadalcanal with the help of the Marines. And then he went to Bougainville and New Hampshire and, and that area to two, I guess, well, the South Pacific was, 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 the islands were small, and they never really fought as a division. Or it was always the most, they call them regimental combat teams. And, and the 37th Division was scattered all over with theirs. And so when I joined them, they, they were all together, and I got in, I was assigned to the 148th Division. And, uh, didn't know anybody. And, uh, I guess there were probably 25 or 30 who got assigned at the same time out of the 3,000. And we all went to the 37th Division, though. And in the middle of the fighting was really pretty severe then. And in fact, by the time we got to Manila, it was really bad. And I, I went. <clears throat> I want to insert something right now, but I keep hearing about how many bad things that we did as a troops in the South Pacific, being blamed for Pearl Harbor, that we were bad people to do something like that. I mean, to, to do what we did, they didn't say anything about theirs. But I first, first of all, in the little towns you'd find some pretty good things that were kind of bad. They, uh, well, to get in, into Manila, the first thing I saw that was really, I thought was terrible, is that they had, we, we came upon it in a church. They had filled the church with people, chained the doors closed, and lit, burned the shirt. And, and and I first started seeing this stuff. I thought, how can people how can people do this? But then you go to the next block and an area where they throw babies up in the air and catch them on their bayonets. Oh, and, and it's just it, that was the Japanese. Oh yeah, it's bad. It's, but but I want you to understand, they were bad people. Anyone that I uh, plus uh, one part of one part of Manila was crossing a river called the Pasig River into this walled city. And it's 
the, the prison with Santa Tomas, seeing those, our, our guys as prisoners and how they were treated. It, it, it's hard to believe. It's really, really hard to believe. And so we had, that's what we had to live with. Uh, and, and by the time we were still in Manila, and by the time um, MacArthur came, <laughs> we, were, we were already pushing in, and, and uh, he came by in a Jeep one day and said hello to us. And then our company was, after Manila was secured, our company was assigned to him for about three, day, three weeks as guards. And then, and it, then Easter Sunday of 45, uh, we left Manila to go to Baguio, which was the summer capital of Manila, and it was up in the mountains. We got, in, we got into street fighting in Manila, and now mountain fighting, so we're not in the jung jungles yet. yet. So, then there's a lot of jungle too, but we got into the, the first night we went to the mountains. It rained a little bit. Now, that whole area is all tropical area, 100 degrees in the daytime all the time. The first day we got into Manila, we didn't get to Bay we were just going up the mountains. And that night we, set, we settled down and for the night and the rain froze our fatigues. Oh. It was, I guess we were about 8,000 feet up. <laughs> and trying to live in that, that was something. And then once we got into the Baguio area, uh, the fighting got pretty bad. And our first encounter, we were as a regiment then. The other, two, the other two regiments were someplace else. But we were, the 148th was to take Baguio, and that's the summer capital. So the first, the road going up to Baguio was a winding mountain road. And the f first morning we went we were on the attack area, we ran into a roadblock, and a bridge was blown out called the Irsan Bridge. And so they picked our company to take a full day to get on the back of that ridge where the bridge was because they had an artillery holding everything up. The tanks couldn't get, one tank went over a ridge and crashed and the, the, the tanks were stopped, they couldn't move. So our company went up, I, I was in I company. So I, it was I company. Uh, we, we bivouacked the night, that night we got there. Then the next morning, it was our assignment to get that bridge opened up. Not, we had to get rid of the artillery that was stopping it. They, they built their own bridge. And <laughs> our squad was picked for the lead. And I'd never done that. I was a scout. So I would, had never done anything like that out in the open. And finally, we, we got in. It, it turned out that eight of us went in and, and took that area. And, uh, and in fact, I, I'll show you. When we were making the approach to the, there were caves along the road. And this, the first cave we hit, our sergeant threw a grenade in the, in the cave, the grenade come flying back out and hit him. And that's how close it was. And they took him out. And so we got a little bit closer, and the fellow standing beside me, a Jap stuck his hand out the hole and just started firing. One bullet hit him, and he was dead when he hit the ground. And I was, I was going down. This is mess kit in my pack on my back. And the bullet hit here. But I got the I got the gun at shot. This. <laughs> that was, and in fact, I got a bronze star for this. <laughs> so we finally took that 
And the, the, the engineers got a bridge built across for the tra tra trucks to get in, I mean the tanks to get in. And uh, we, we took Baggio on the day that Franklin Roosevelt died. Uh, I had the date here someplace, but this is the day we the flag went up at half staff. And so we, I stayed, I guess we stayed there for about a week. Always, anytime you, and there were probably 20,000 chaps. I don't, I don't know, we didn't shoot them all, but some of them got away. But you, you, you have to meet the people who were living there, the natives, the people who loved it, and what what was done to them. And I, I, I'm really taking too much time with this, but I want people to understand they were bad to the natives themselves. And, and uh, I, that same spot, I, 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 there was a sniper in one of the houses, one of the houses, and I, I saw, I spotted him, and I was close enough that I could throw a grenade in, and I did. I threw the grenade in, and when I got in there, there was a, he was living with a native with a baby, and they were all three dead. Mm. That was kind of hard to take. But the, the, the girl was living with him, and so she, But I, I, I want people to understand, I get, I hear so many I get so irritated when I hear how bad we were. And we never treated anybody, never. Even when we took a prisoner, never treated him badly. Or at least I, can, I, I never saw any. So Baguio was, next we had to go to another place called, was the, by this time, the whole war in the South Pacific was, coming to an end. You could sense it. Uh, this was during the time of Iwo Jima, Guadalcanal, I mean, not, uh, Okinawa. And we were doing this at that same time in another hour. So, so everybody kind of sensed it was turning, going to be over pretty soon. But the, this Lady Pass was the last stronghold of the Japanese on Luzon. And that was a very, very critical thing to get breakthrough there. The, the airborne was going to drop in the northern tip of Luzon, and we were working up, walking up. So we got, no, this was a valley. It's called the Kagean Valley. It was probably two or three miles wide and like about 100 miles up, flat. So now here's another area that's different than jungle fighting or mountain fighting. It's all wide open. And, and as, as I said, I was a scout at the time. They took the scouts out of the regiment, put them in, made a company out of them, and put us in uh, scout cars that had 50 caliber, four 50 caliber machine guns mounted on each car. And you had to sit down in the seat to fire it. I'd never seen anything like that. But they taught us about an hour. We had to learn, we had to learn how to. And going up the valley, well, the first day, we walked for 21 miles, 110 degrees. And uh, walked for, 100, for 21 miles, and, and walked for miles. And, but when you got the scout cars, the, we, when we before did the scout the first day, as we were walking, if it would be a building or something, somebody would shoot across and check, check the building, and almost all the time there was nobody in it. So then the next day we gave us the scout cars. Then we went probably 40 miles. And just every time you shot into one of those buildings with those 50 calibers, they just burst into flames from the from the. Bullets. And then, then they got rid of that because it, it wasn't, wasn't effective. We had to get to the, further, the northern tip of Luzon to meet the airborne 
who was going to jump. And, and we, we met them, and we met their gap at the same time. There was, it was not much of a fight. So then, after that was done, we took the surrender at that spot. At the time of the surrender, our platoon was on an outpost, and we had, a, we had met the commander of an engineering group of the Japs, and his name was Matsui. So we had given them a radio. He was Matsui one, and we were Matsui two, talking back to each other. And uh, finally, it was a whole battalion that our platoon brought in. And that was when all the sword swapping was going on. And it finally ended the war and on Luzon. In fact, our division commander, General Beatler, who became the commander of the Philippine Islands. Uh, one, one little... <clears throat> uh, Ohio National Guard, it's hard, hard to tell who you're going to run into. But when I got later on, years going by, and I was sitting at the David Mead one time when they had the bar and we were having a drink, and I was talking to Jim Starn, and somehow he said to me, what did you do during the war? I was in the South Pacific. What were you with? I was 37. 37? Yeah, he said, oh, I don't believe that. You're too, you're too young for that. I said, well, no, I was in 148. And then that's when he told me. <coughs> it was Captain Jim Starn, company commander, who started as a sergeant, he got a field commission in the 37th, 148th Regiment. So we had a lot in common. We talked about that for a long time. But I, and then one of the, one of the V day, V day, JJ, BJ days down here, he, he was here to talk. He's now gone though. And now I, I belong to the 37th Division. We had Union Camp Perry last summer, this past summer, and I went to it. I was the only World War II veteran there. But Jim, you were there about two years, right? Pardon me? You were there about two years? Two. two. My brother was over there, and, and I, he was 15 years old. I, I was, he was in the Navy. I never heard much about it because he, was always, I never, he didn't live around here. But anyway, I can remember that the typhoons were really bad. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was some of the biggest problems the, the, the palm trees were flying through the air like bullets. I, <laughs> you could see them flying. I did lay down. In fact, I remember one time I stuck my band in the ground to hold on to it. <laughs> but that, the, 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 the living condition, that's another thing. The living conditions alone, if nothing else, was terrible. <coughs> It, it was dirty, it was filthy, and it was swamps were full of bugs and snakes, and it was just a filthy place to live. Then we got to Manila, it was pretty nice. Oh, when we went to Manila, the order was nothing heavier than a 16 millimeter mortar, and that's like, like, like a firecracker. And the buildings, were, I thought it was in Washington, D.C., and it just looked like our capital. The legislature. We ended up room to room fighting. Here's the one room, there in the next. That's kind of fun too. But anyway, after after the Luzon was considered closed, they brought the whole division together to the outskirts of Manila, and so we start forming as a division to go to Japan. And our mo our mo spot in Japan was going to be Tokyo. So we, got, we were getting all new clothes and new weapons. And we were getting really... And I, I, bring, I bring that up because of the bomb. All of us were being told in advance. I, our company commander gave us a little talk one morning about what it was going to be like in Japan. It's another new type of war because there can be a lot of kamikazes, not in airplanes, but just people walking. And, and I can remember the last thing he said, 
I don't give a goddamn what's out in front of you. Shoot it. <laughs> that's how it's going to be. It just, just the way it was going to be. And then, uh, that's hard to that's hard to imagine. Well, in, in Manila, there was a baby in diapers out in the middle of the street, crying. And one buddy of mine said, "I'm going out and get it." I said, "Be careful. I'll cover you." When he picked the baby up, they both blew up. It's a little tiny baby. So, and I figured, boy, when we get in the home, homeland, it's going to be something. But fortunately, we didn't have to go. When they dropped the bombs, uh, everybody was very pleased. And uh, so we all started home. I had malaria pretty badly, and it was pretty bad, so I said to myself, I'm going to stay here in a while, stay, in, stay for a while. So I volunteered to go to Germany and went to find out what was going on over there. So I did, and I got put in the first division in the MP company. Perfect. Now I'm going to be a state trooper. I'll learn how to be a cop. <laughs> that kind of a thing really didn't happen. I, they said, you know you shot some Japs, could you shoot some, shoot some Germans? I, well, if they're their enemy, I can shoot them, I guess. So it turned out when the war was over in Germany, a lot of the Germans, especially SS troopers, didn't surrender. They were causing problems. And so. That's what I got involved in when I went to Germany. I did that for about, oh, six months, seven months. And, and we were, this is during the time of Nuremberg trials, when we'd, we'd get word from the CIA that there was a meeting someplace. And we'd say, they'd tell us to go bust it up. The, the MP company would go. We'd have signed, go break up the meeting, and then take who's ever leading the meeting or whoever you think should be questioned to take them, to question them. And then when you question them, if they sounded like they should be in Nuremberg, I made three trips to Nuremberg calling prisoners to be tried. In fact, the second trip, and, that, and by then I knew that sergeant we reported to, he said, how would you like to meet Herman Goring? I said, who's he? <laughs> I didn't know anything about him. He said, well, he's a pretty, pretty important guy. And he said, that's Goring right there. He's like from here to John. I said, no, I don't want to shake hands with him. But I thought, I think of myself today, if I had just walked over and, and I know I could have gotten it. Say, would you sign this, your autograph for me? <laughs> I could have had his one, but I didn't get it. And then the, two days later, he took the pill. But, well, uh, speaking of Nuremberg, I, I get the World War II magazine. And this is, this is the uh, July and August magazine. And that's my buddy. He, and I, he was the hangsman for all the nerve. And, and we were good friends. <laughs> I, was, I was taking the people up there for him, got him to hang. <laughs> but it, it, they, the story in here is not a good story. It, it, they made it. Did he? Did this man deliberately botch Nazi execution because he? They say he loved the penalty. You know, penalize him. Make it hard to die. Uh, he, he was just a quiet, just a nice guy like me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, the, the, I'm, I'm away from the South Pacific now, in Germany, and I, I wanted to talk about that to show you the contrast between Germans and Japs. Big. I learned to like the Germans. I learned to, because most of them were like us. 
They were drafted in the wallpaper hangers and butchers and school teachers. They were just like us. Once you got to know them. In fact, we had a, at one point I, I was working in the stockade, the first division stockade with our own prisoners, the GIs. And the guy who was doing the maintenance, he and I became pretty good friends. I ended up being godfather to two of his kids <laughs> in Germany. I thought I'd never do that. But it was, you got to like them because they were human beings. And, they, and I, I, now, on the other hand, I want you to know that I had to spend a lot of time in the, being, a, being an MP. There's, there were camps called displaced persons camps. And that was when, when towns were blown up and people were then left over. Their families were gone. They didn't know where they were. They, they'd put them in a deep place. And that was terrible, terrible living. But then some of the uh, prison camps, like, like, like Dachau and that type of place, they, they were as bad as the Japs. And, Although I don't think they, I don't think they tortured people as much, but some places they did. Uh, Could you understand the Germans? Pardon me. Could you understand the Germans? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> but, but there was something about, uh, for example, most of Germany that I was in, in the Regensburg and uh, uh, the. the <laughs> Anyway, Nuremberg, yeah, Nuremberg, Regensburg, uh, Frankfurt, those, the middle of Germany was exactly like Pennsylvania. Same weather, same temperatures, same trees, everything was very much like Pennsylvania. And I, I, I really enjoyed it. And then I, I, got, I had 36 months overseas you have to go home. So I, I just I go home now. But anyway, I, I wanted the dif difference between who we were fighting in both sides. And I did things with the Germans that I would have never been able to do over the other side. Never. I just couldn't do it. Uh, I, I didn't have too much too much fighting, but we had some, some of those times when we had to break the meetings up. We go, oh, the first time. Now, I remember I come back from the South Pacific, and I, I could shoot a Tommy gun very good. So the first raid, the first assignment we got, there was a, a meeting, and the German houses, even, even those little, nice, it was a nice little house, had a little balcony on it second floor, and the lieutenant said to me, Therat, you go across the street in that doorway there where it's dark so they don't see you, but don't let any come, anybody come out the front door. <laughs> so I had to tell him again. And as soon as they broke in the back door, the crash of the back door, a woman jumped out on that balcony and started screaming, pull it side. I thought she was saying over the side. <laughs> I emptied the Tommy gun right above her head. <laughs> she didn't come down, <laughs> but we had to pay for the house. <laughs> so, so he said, Drat, you don't get a Tommy gun anymore. <laughs> but th those are, you can laugh about them now, but at the time, it wasn't laughable. And then, but I did get a Tommy gun again. They, they, they needed it. <laughs> but. It, I, 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 I spent Thanksgiving, I was on patrol one day for, on Thanksgiving. I was just out riding all by myself and kind of enjoying the country. And a woman saw me, a German woman saw me. She was out in waves, I thought she was in trouble. Invited me in for Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, I, oh. Yeah, that was, that was kind of nice. And I went in. Turkey? <laughs> yeah? Oh, well, the food was, 
they were, they were just like we were, really. Uh, it's, it's hard to imagine that. All of them didn't want to be in the war. Uh, I gave more, I, I started smoking when I was in, in, in South Pacific, then I quit when I went to Germany. And I was giving my cigarettes to the people and they, they, they appreciated it. And it, they, they, they recognized some of us being the same as they were too. And, and I don't, I don't, there weren't too many exciting things like it was in, in the war. But it was, uh, when, we, when we first got there, we weren't even allowed to talk to the Germans, not fraternize with them in any way. And even as an MP, then they did believe it for us because we were, had to question people all the time. And, uh, but I, I, I did enjoy that. And I'm sorry I had to come on from there, but, but I wanted to be a state trooper. And that's how I got to meet them. <laughs> I think that's about the, that's a good half hour or so. Yeah. Jim, will you tell them um, about how, what happened in Germany that eventually led to cable? television? Oh, yeah. Oh. Well, that, that, that didn't happen in Germany, but I know what, what... When cable television first started, it started in Pennsylvania, in the eastern part of the state. And, and I learned this when we were back home, of course. But in Germany, they had to set radio stations for the military. And they'd take a truck with the radio station would be in a truck. They'd take it up on the top of a mountain or hill, put an antenna up, and you have a radio station. But by the time the antenna went up, the artillery came in and blew it up. Blew up the antenna and the truck. And so there was a young fellow from the eastern part of the state named Joe Gans worked was working for a guy who had a, an appliance store. And he was doing repair work for all kinds of appliances. And then television came along. And so he went, the guy wanted to sell television. But he was in Mahanoy City, which is right down between two mountains, right on the bottom between two mountains. He couldn't demonstrate. So the little kid who was in the, he was in the communications department in the military in Germany who set up radio stations. And he said to John, he said, John, I got an idea. We, we were doing what, you put the radio station and antenna on top of the hill and it'd get blown up. We decided to leave the radio, the truck, down at the bottom of the hill and run a wire up to an antenna. I said, that should work for television too. Well, they put stuff together and it, it worked. They put the, put the television in the guy's store down at the bottom of the hill and ran the wire up to the top of the hill, put an antenna. In fact, they just laid the wire on the trees to come down. And it, it was back, they had two wires called railroad tracks, it looked like railroad tracks with two wires with spacers in them. They just threw it on the trees and brought it down. They had, they had a big show down in downtown. And that's how it started. That's really how it started. Yeah. We, we started something, but not that big. Yes, sir. Jim, have you been back to the Philippines or Germany since you've served there? Since what? Have you been back to the Philippines? No. No, no. no I, no, you couldn't pay me to go back. I have no desire to go back. It, uh, I, I, I was on five or six different islands, and they're all the same. They, I'm sure now they have, I know Manila's back up again, doing fine. So the prisoners from the uh, Baton, that happened after you were in Germany? No, I, I saw some of them. I, oh, you did? 
that I carried some of them out. That was, that's another thing. That should have never been. But those poor, and if that, were, if, if that, were, that, were, that was like 100 miles from Bataan to Manila. And the guys we relieved in Manila were the, from the Bataan Death March. And they called it the Bataan Death March. And they would, if they fell down, they got bayoneted. So, I, we never, we we never did anything like that, and I, I it, it really bothers me a lot now when 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 they say that what we did with the bombs was far more than what they did at Pearl Harbor. Well, I'm gonna, I I I know now from from my history is that I probably wouldn't be here today. If I had to go to Japan, we saw that the kamikazes did a lot of damage in Okinawa. And, and in fact, in our in our beach, we lost two carriers. They weren't kamikazes then, but then they got big shell bombed out. But, but then when they started. They had, I, there are thousands of airplanes ready to be used for the invasion of Japan. It, it was all ready to go. And as they say, it would have been other things besides airplanes. A person could be a, well, like, like they're doing now with, the, with carrying the bombs on them. Oh, in, in Manila, if you took a block, that night, someone would come out and kneel down in the middle of the street, put a grenade in their chest, kill themselves, right, right in front of us. It's, it's just all part of their life. It's a different life. Yes? Hey, Jim, tell them about the playing cards you found. The what? The playing cards. The oh, cards. yeah. Oh, there's a, yeah, when we, when, the Lady Pass. This is a, be interesting. We relieved the 25th Division was in South Pacific at Pearl Harbor. They were there, so that they were the first ones in the fight. Then the 37 was second. So when we finished in Baguio. They sent us to the Lady Pass to relieve part of the 25th Division, one regiment. And so when we got there, we moved right into their foxholes so we didn't have to dig any. Two, two stories now. And we, I, my buddy and I moved into one hole. And I, as we were moving, I looked and I said, it's a deck of cards. And I said, geez, no wonder these guys can't take that hill. They're playing cards. <laughs> <laughs> so I just kind of put them in my pocket. And, Never thought any more about it. In, in fact, that place we're talking about now, I, I didn't want to go through. But the the day the, the day after we got there, they used our squad for a recon patrol to the top of that hill. And as they said, a scout is a scout. I was on top of that hill the day, the next day we were there, and it did so one job way off on another mountain, cooking something. Didn't see anybody else. So the next day, we're going to take the hill. And the next day, as we were walking up to take that hill, the word passed past that Germany surrendered. <laughs> and about after that, hour after that, Germany didn't surrender for us because we were really getting hit pretty hard. The Japs were dug in so bad, so good. In fact. <laughs> It was about 10 feet away where I got pinned down. One came out of a hole. That was that close. And, and one, somebody, somebody threw two grenades, and I heard them pop. I was down in the hole looking up like that. One was coming right at me. And I just kind of reached up and 
hit it with my hand and batted it away. <laughs> the other one landed right next to me, blew my helmet off, and but all, all I get was a piece of stone stuck in my ear. <laughs> so after things quieted down, I, I looked right, like from here to here. There's two, two dead ones that that one I fit back must have hit him. It's, it's, but going back now to the deck of cards, many years later, in Meadville, in fact, we were in, in Florida. Andy Costa was with us. And we were in Florida, after the game, we start talking about where we were in, in the war. And he said he was, I thought he was in the Navy. Uh, for some reason, I thought he was in the Navy. He started talking about he was in the Philippines. And I said, where? He started telling me, for Lady Pass. He, I said, well, Andy, we're the guys that relieved you. He said, did you find a deck of cards? <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> I said, yeah, I found them. I only wish I had them. I had them. It was too long a period of time. But I'm sure this had to be his cards. I moved in that same hole he was in. I probably talked to him, because we didn't talk to each other when they were leaving. And then the other thing that the day before we made the attack on that hill we were looking for, ships, battleships, 12 miles away. And they threw 16 inch shells 200 yards in front of us from 12 miles. Oh. When they went over our heads, they thought it was a locomotive. In fact, we had ponchos over our hole for the rain. All of a sudden, I'm laying in a hole, hole <laughs> popping holes in that punch from the dirt from that ship. Or stones. And, uh, and we still lost a lot of guys on that. But thanks, Scott. <laughs> hey, Jim. Jim, My hands are sweating listening to you. <laughs> um, any lasting emotional effects, nightmares from, from the war? Oh, yeah. It just takes a while. Yeah. In fact, Talking about it now, I know I'll, I'll see it tonight. Just can't help. And it gets pretty real sometimes. But I, I, I have to say too, I was lucky enough. I had a couple of close calls, and but I made it, and I was part of it. And I can say I, I, I'm proud of it. Tell him you got to meet Louis Zamperini. Pardon me? Louis Zamperini. Oh, I've got, I got his picture here. Any, anybody read that magazine? Yeah. I met him in Chicago. That's Louis right there. See how small he is? He was, he was beat badly. Maybe they don't know who he was. Huh? Maybe they don't know who Louis Zamperini is. Yeah. They, he, he was in the Air Force, and they got the plane went down in the Pacific, in a, and he, he was on a, a rubber mast 42 days. And he finally found some ground, and he landed, he and another guy, and it turned out that ground was occupied by the Japanese, and they took him into prison. And he, it was a terrific movie. But it was, he, he died about a year after I saw this, took his picture of it. He, he was a great athlete, runner. And uh, I belonged to a group called the Italian American Sports Hall of Fame in Chicago. And they told me he was going to be there. They asked me if I wanted to come. So I went. That's how I met him. Great guy. Great guy. And that's a good movie. If you ever see it, it's a good movie. Jim, you're lucky to get through all this, but we're lucky that you come to me, though. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. You know, Carl, I feel the same way. 
I am lucky. You are. You're super yeah, I, oh, you're about to close the door and another one opens. I closed a few doors to get here. And, uh, that's, I, I, I gave up the state police. I, I gave some other stuff up too. But it, it, and I'm glad I'm here. I, I often say to myself, how? How did this ever happen? How did I come into town and move into the Barco family? I don't know, but it, it worked. And I'm glad I'm still here. I never thought I'd be here this long. Either. <laughs> yes. Thank you.